welcome to the snooze cast the podcast designed to help you fall asleep on the snooze cast we read excerpts from public domain works as well as original stories we'd like to thank our listeners if you enjoy our show please subscribe and share it with a friend if you have a book or topic idea please get in touch on our website snoozecast.com This program is brought to you by the feeling of warm afternoon sunshine on your skin. Tonight, I'll be reading the snoozy opening chapters from How a Dear Little Couple Went Abroad. This cutesy turn-of-the-century children's book was originally published in 1900 by Mary Dow Brine, a New York-based author who published several works in Harper's Magazine in the 1800s. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, Take a few deep breaths. Chapter 1. Polly thinks over her surprise. Polly opened her blue eyes one lovely morning in May and found the sun fairies, as she called them, dancing all about her wee bedchamber and telling her in their own bright way that it was high time little girls were up and dressing for breakfast. At first, she was sure she had been having a beautiful dream, for what else could make her feel so happy and so sort of all overish, as if something very nice and unusual had come upon her? She was sure she had dreamed that a splendid surprise had happened, and it was something about going away, too. Polly lay still in her little white nest of a bed and thought over her dream, and lo, on a sudden, as she grew more and more awake, the real cause of her new and glad sensations came into her curly head, and she bounced like a little rubber ball right out of bed and danced a wee lively jig on the floor. Why, of course it wasn't a dream. No, indeed. It was a real, oh, as real as Polly Darling herself, and no wonder she had felt so all overish and so glad all inside of her. She sat down on the soft carpet and drew her stockings and shoes on, but it was slow work because Polly was thinking, and she had a great deal to think about, you see. First, oh, how it all came back to her now. First, she remembered that last night after supper, Papa had taken her on his knee and whispered in her ear, Polybus, how would you like to go with Mama and Papa across the sea for a little trip? And while she was squeezing him almost to pieces by way of answer, Mama had come along and had shaken her finger at Papa as she said, Oh, naughty Papa, the idea of telling Polly that just when she's going to bed, she won't sleep a wink for thinking of it. And Polly remembered jumping down from Papa's knee and going to Mama's side, saying very earnestly, Oh, yes, I will. I truly will, Mama. I'll shut my eyes and think about little lambs jumping over a fence, because Cook says that's the best way to get sleepy, and it worked beautifully on her lots of times. Oh, tried and true, black and blue, I'll go right to sleep, and oh, I'm so happy. And pretty soon after that, the bedtime for little girls had come, and Polly had been kissed and petted a little, as she was usually done after she had snuggled down in bed, and had a little while alone with her dear mamma, and then she had tried very hard to keep her promise, and go right to sleep. 
But, oh dear, it had been such hard work to keep those blue eyes shut. No matter how much she thought of the lambs jumping, one after the other, over the imaginary fence, it did not make her the least bit sleepy, and the lambs all seemed to scamper off to Europe as soon as they had jumped the fence, and of course Polly's thoughts had to go flying after them. So, you see, it had really been a long time before the little tired lids had closed over those dear, soft blue eyes, and sleep had really come. But when it did come, you may be sure it was a very sound, sweet sleep, and so when Polly awakened in the morning, it could hardly be wondered at that she thought she had been having a beautiful dream. She knew now that it was no dream, but a most delightful reality, and oh, how happy she was. She came to the end of her long think at last, and turned her attention to her dressing, and just then, Mama came in to put the finishing touches to the process, and Polly's tongue wagged so fast all the while that it really seemed as though it were hung in the middle, like a little sweet-toned bell, and able to swing both ways. However, Mama patiently answered all the rapid questions, and explained that Papa, having to go abroad on business, had decided that it would do Mama and Polly good to also go, and be the best thing to keep him from being lonely, of course. And she told Polly something else that had not been told the night before, but kept for an added surprise this morning, and that was that Teddy's mama and papa had given permission for Teddy to go with Polly to Europe as a great and wonderful treat for both little folks. But Teddy didn't know it yet, because both mamas thought Polly would enjoy telling him herself and giving him a delightful surprise. So you may run over right after breakfast, added Mama, and tell him the good news. This additional beautiful surprise was more than Polly could bear in an ordinary way, so she just simply cried for joy. You've heard of people doing that. And in the midst of her tears, she began to laugh. And then she cried a little more, and it seemed a long time before the little happy Polly settled down and was able to eat her breakfast. Chapter 2 Teddy's Surprise Perhaps before I go any further, I ought to explain to those of my little friends who have not chanced to read the first book about the doings of a dear little couple that Polly and Teddy were next-door neighbors in the pretty village which was their home, and that they had been, during all their acquaintance with each other, most loving and devoted little chums. They were each seven years old at the time of my last writing, but at the time of this story had become eight-year-olders, and Teddy insisted that because their birthdays came together, they were real truly twinses. Now I will return to my story. When Polly finished her breakfast and was excused from the table, she scampered off as fast as she could down the garden till she came to the little gap in the fence of which my first book told you, you remember, and called, Teddy, Teddy, oh, Teddy Terry, as loud as she could all the while she was running. Now, it happened that Teddy Terry was eating his breakfast at that time, and he was just putting a piece of potato into his rosy mouth when he heard Polly's eager voice. He swallowed that piece of potato so fast that it nearly choked him, and when he had finally gotten it out of the way, he said, "'Please, excuse me, Mama, Papa,' and slipping from his chair, was off in a jiffy to meet his little chum, Polly. "'Oh, Teddy, come up in our tree!' cried Polly, 
as Teddy's curly brown head pushed through the low gap in the dividing hedge fence. Come quick, quick, quick. I've got the goodest news in the whole world to tell you about. She danced about on her little toes while speaking, and Teddy's plump body, having speedily followed his head, he left the fence, and with his little companion, ran for the old apple tree which, as you remember I told you in the first book, was the consultation office of our dear little couple whenever they had an especially private conversation with each other. So up into the stout branches of the old tree they clambered and settled comfortably down in a safe fork of limbs amid a thicket of green leaves, and then, after Teddy had followed his usual loving habit of kissing Polly on her soft little cheek and receiving the same sweet greeting from her, she proceeded to tell her secret. I'd ask you to guess it first, she said, but, oh, Teddy, Terry, you never could in the whole world. It's this. You and I are going to Europe with my mama and papa. There. What do you think of that, Teddy Terry? Oh, isn't it the very bestest news we could have? Aren't you surprised most to pieces? Teddy's brown eyes opened so wide that it is a wonder they did not stretch out of shape. Surprised? Well, indeed he was, and when Polly had told him more about the matter, he gave the loudest whoopla he could. And then a funny thing happened. He slid off that tree and disappeared in the woodshed nearby, and... I don't know, Shirley, but I think it likely he went in there to hide the tears that came to his eyes, the tears of joy which Polly had had, you know, only Teddy didn't want her to see him turn crybaby, so he went in there quickly. But Polly soon found him there, and together they went to see his mother. And then he learned more fully all about the pleasure in store for him, and that Mama and Papa had consented to let him go because they had been called unexpectedly away a long distance to see a sick relative, and it made them glad to know that their little son would be safe and happy with Polly and her mother and father during that time. Afterwards, when Teddy and Polly were again together, they talked the coming trip over, as children do, and were greatly excited and delighted. I promised Mama solemnly, oh, just as solemnly as I could, that I'd be the goodest behaving boy your Mama ever saw, said Teddy, when he and Polly tired of jumping about and shouting whoop, at last sat down on the grass to talk it over. And, and, she said she wasn't afraid to trust me at all. Course not, responded Polly. You're the best that ever could be to keep promises, and if you forgot about them, it's just because you couldn't truly really help it. The more they talked over the wonderful new surprise, the more excited the dear little couple were growing, and the number of times Teddy put soft kisses on his Polly's cheek, one of his sweet little ways of expressing his joy at any time over pleasures they were to share together. I cannot tell you, but you may be sure he did not limit his kisses in the least, dear, loving little chum as he was. Chapter 3 Starting Day As the days went by, the children grew very restless, wishing the starting day would come. Ted's mama had packed his little trunk and marked it T.T., and finally, when only one more day remained of the between days, as the children called them, Mr. and Mrs. Terry had bidden their little son goodbye and started off on their own journey. 
so Teddy was all the more glad when the great day came at last. Hurrah, hurrah, Polly! This is our starting day. Polly, why don't you halloo? I'm going to halloo, replied Polly. Listen, and her voice rang out in a clear shout about which even reached down to the gate. Once more, cried Teddy, and this time his voice joined hers, and Mama, coming to the hall door, looked out to see what was going on. It's cause we're so glad, Mama Deary, replied Polly to the question asked, and it's our starting day, you know. She was perched upon the piazza rail nearest the piazza of Teddy's house, and Teddy was to have breakfast with her presently. Just now he was having his jacket well brushed by Bridget, as he stood on his own piazza, and he was so impatient to get over to Polly that he could hardly stand still long enough for the brushing. Go and enter the dirty windshed just to see about that tricycle, said Bridget, grumbling as she brushed, and sillin' you that brand new suit your ma brought you for you traveling. I told you I'd put it safe away. Well, I wanted to see if you hadn't only thought you'd put it safe, explained Teddy, who had considered it a very manly thing to investigate his affairs himself, and had consequently gotten his new clothes into disgrace. There now, you're clean and sweet as a rose, and it's so bridgy who'll be missing the trouble of yourself. And for sure you'll be wanting some more of the same, said the good woman, giving him a parting hug and pat before he was off to join Polly. At half past nine, the carriage was to come for them and their trunks, and they would catch the 10 a.m. train for New York and say goodbye to their pretty village home for a long time. It was truly a very exciting morning, and Polly's mood for rhyming was so strong that she finally accomplished this wonderful couplet, which Teddy admired as much as she did herself. It ran this way, Oh, Teddy Terry, we're going away, for this, this, this is our starting day. So Ted caught the rhyme, and joining in the singing of it, and if it was sung once, it certainly was sung twenty times, till at last Papa put his head out of the window and asked if they would mind giving him and the neighbors something new. Breakfast over, the little couple sat down on the sofa in the hall and watched the clock and at last the little hammer inside lifted itself and struck against the bell waiting beside it. And lo and behold, there came the carriage driving up the road and through the big gate and up to the door. Then the trunks were put on the rack behind while Teddy watched closely to see that the man did not forget to go and get the T.T. little trunk. Bridget and Anne were on hand to say the last goodbyes. Mama gave a few last directions and entered the carriage. Papa poked the small couple in, topsy-turvy style, got in himself, called out goodbye to the servants, who were wiping their eyes with the corners of their aprons, and the long-anticipated start had taken place. Polly was radiant. She hugged Papa, squeezed Mama, threw her arms around Teddy, and kissed him over and over, getting as many kisses from him as she gave, you may be sure, and finally settled down with a long sigh of deep, pure content, and said, 
She was so happy she felt crowded inside of her, right up to her throat. And Teddy, not willing to feel different from Polly, said, So do I. I won't be able to tell you very much of the short journey to the city of New York, for I've neither time nor space for it. But you know Polly and Teddy were just like you, my dear little boys and girls, and they enjoyed a few hours of train ride past fields and villages, hills and meadows, and all the various kinds of landscape views. They watched from the windows of their car, just as much as you have enjoyed such little trips. And moreover, they were just as restless and fidgety. When feeling that they wanted to have a good runabout and couldn't, because they were shut up in a railroad car so long, as all little folks who are real live little folks are apt to get under such circumstances. But the cars sped on and on, and after a while they rushed pell-mell into the long, dark tunnel, which Polly at once recognized as the beginning of the end of their journey to New York City. Now, just as soon as we get into the light again, and under a big, high roof, and the cars stop, that will be New York. Oh, Teddy Terry, aren't you glad we're almost there? In his excitement, Teddy forgot where he was, and jumping to his feet, he shouted, Whoop! as loudly as if he had been standing in his own garden at home. Then, with an immediate sense of his mistake, the little boy dropped again into his seat and covered his mouth with both hands, while his little crimson face was a pitiful sight to see. Oh, I forgot, said he. I truly did forget, but I did feel so full of halloo. I, I... It came right out for I guessed it would. He looked very penitent, but whispered to Polly, Don't you wish you could halloo, Polly darling? I should think you would. Teddy Terry, I'm just bursting to halloo as loud as I can, but I suppose we'll have to keep on wanting to and never doing it while we're European travelers. It'll be hard holding it in, Teddy, but we've got to do it. Truly we do. Else Mama and Papa will be shamed of our queerness again. Don't you see? Teddy saw and made up his mind to crowd his hallooing feelings as deeply down inside of him as possible in the future. And just then, the train gave a jerk and began to move again.